now, now can I preach? Have I done enough? Have I riffed long enough? Okay. Finally. Uh, we're moving into something new, a new short mini-series uh, called Call Cost Cast. I was feeling like a tie-dye vibe. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, we're talking about discipleship. <laughs> talking about discipleship just for a month here. And if you've been following along, that makes perfect sense to you, right? Of course we're talking about discipleship because we talked about repentance for a few weeks and this process of moving out of our old lives and into the new uh, creation, the new life that Jesus is calling us into. And then we talked about baptism, this way that we participate in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And now, wh what do you do next? You live the life of a disciple, right? right. And so we're going to talk about what it means to be called by Jesus, the cost of discipleship, and this idea of casting that vision for others. And I'm really excited to talk about the call of discipleship today, this word discipleship, because words matter. Words are incredibly important. I've learned this the hard way by saying the wrong words. I've learned this the, the better way by sometimes saying the right thing when it's needed. Uh, I think about a conversation I had this week on campus. I was you know, talking to a young guy, asking him about, do you think it's possible to have a relationship with God? And we're, we're talking, and he's kind of getting there. And I invited him out to see what our, our campus ministry is all about. And he goes, oh, is that, a, is that a, like a church thing? <laughs> and the way he said it, it was like a curse word. He's like, church thing. I was like, right. Right. right? And so I said, well, it's a community of young men and women who are just calling each other higher, trying to, to live more like Jesus and love one another and, and love, and love our, our, our university better. He's like, that sounds, that actually sounds pretty good. I said, that's a church. <laughs> like, I didn't actually say it. I didn't actually say it. In my head, I was like, that's just church, dude. But, but that word church, it doesn't mean what it used to mean. Even 30, 40, 50 years ago, the word church was inspiring. It was a place of safety and community. And now, because of hurt, because of misuse and abuse, because of a, a variety of different reasons, the word church doesn't mean what it used to mean. That's right. Words matter. Okay, Brian, if you insist. How about this word discipleship? Does the word discipleship mean the same thing today that it meant 50 years ago? Immediate no's, that's interesting. It definitely, it definitely might mean something different than it did 2,000 years ago. This word discipleship, I, I grew up in our churches, and so I know the history well. I, I sat on people's knees, and I heard about would-be disciples sitting in people's living rooms. And, and this word disciple, when I was a kid, it meant something. We, we used it in hushed tones. Mm -hmm. It's like, he's going to become a disciple. Oh, seriously? No way. Right, right. It was an honor. It was a privilege. Oh, you're going to be a disciple? And we'd stand out. We, we felt like as a church, our, our, our family of churches, the ICOC, we're, we're different because we're disciples we're not just Christians or believers. We're disciples. Yeah. We'd have discipleship conferences. And we'd talk about discipleship. And it was different. But over the years, it feels like, this is just my experience, it feels like in the last 20 years, that word has started to get a little stale. Yeah. Not that it should. Mm -hmm. Not that it's supposed to. But, but I think there's danger in our lives not living up to the standards set by that word. Words matter. So when I say, I'm a disciple, you've never seen a Christian like, uh, like me before, but then I look like everybody else. When my Christianity is the same Christianity that's driving people away from the church, words matter. So we're going to talk about two things today. We're going to talk about how discipleship, this call of discipleship is a privilege. And we're going to talk about how it comes with a promise, a privilege and a promise that this call to discipleship from Jesus himself is both sacred and holy, and it's available to anybody. It's an incredibly special thing that anyone can have. So turn with me in Mark 1. That's good enough. Mark 1, I love that Jesus begins his ministry by calling. So he starts the whole shebang. Mark 1, verse 14 after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, you know the one, the boat, the men, the hands, the nets. My son loves that one. As he's walking beside, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people. 
at once they left their nets and followed him. And the uh, when he had gone a little farther, he saw, I just did an optometry thing this week, and I have a new glasses prescription, and uh, I feel 90. Uh, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This might seem like a stunning interaction, right? Jesus walks up to these strangers who are working. They're doing their job. She's going to be just fine, guys. Trust me. We got the best in the business. Becca True, we're on the case. Jesus walks up to these assumed strangers. He stops them from doing their jobs, from earning their livelihood. He just commands them, follow me. Kevin Santa Cruz, whatever it is, right? <laughs> Follow me. And they do it. That's not how it works. I can tell you from personal experience this week, that is not how this works. <laughs> I was walking up to strange young men and going, Follow me. And they were like, Ew, who are you? <laughs> That's not how that works. It looks a little bit different now. It's like, Hey, come play some spike ball. Let's hang out. Let me get to know you a little bit. We're a little softer than it was back then. But you have to understand, as stunning as this interaction is now, back then it was common. It was a privilege. See, back in Jesus' day, these rabbis, they would travel from town to town. They'd show up. The town would host them. They would teach. And by the end of their time teaching, the rabbi would be kind of doing a little, little investigation. He'd go, who are, who are the good students? Who are the guys who showed up and they were like, taking this really seriously. Who knows their Torah well? And the rabbi potentially would call a group of young men from that town. And it was the greatest honor you could ever achieve as a young Jewish boy in like the 12, 13 year old area to be called by a rabbi. In fact, it makes perfect sense that these guys jumped out of their boat, they left their dad, they left their livelihood because there was no calling like it. It was a privilege. Rabbis and students had a relationship basically unlike anything. We don't have an equivalent for it today. There's stories. I love these. There's stories of, uh, of, of uh, Talmudim, what they call them, uh, students of a rabbi sleeping underneath the bed of their rabbi just in case the rabbi woke up in the middle of the night, had something he wanted to say to them. They followed, right? Uh, there's, there's stories of, uh, of Talmudim going into the, the bathroom with their rabbi because who knows? Maybe, maybe something gets shaken loose and the rabbi has something important to say in that moment. You never know. Not my experience, but who knows, right? The, the idea was that the, the student would follow the rabbi so closely, they said, the dust from the rabbi's feet would get into the mouths of the students. That's how closely you are meant to follow your rabbi. We don't really have an equivalent in our world today. Your boss does not expect that of you. Probably even doesn't want you that close to them, if we're being completely honest. If you showed up at my house and you were like, it's dusty in here, I'd be like, let's get coffee somewhere else. I don't know if I want to see you at my house. There's nothing like it today. But, but words matter. Titles matter. A calling matters. And so if we're going to use this word disciple and go, I'm special. I'm a disciple. I've been called by God. This is still the standard. Do you know the, the urgency in this passage? Do you see what's going on here? There we go. It says, the time has come. That's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of message that Jesus is preaching here. He says, the kingdom of God has come near. He says, at once they left their nets. Without delay, he called them. And without delay, they answered. There's an urgency to this calling because it might only come once in your life. This is serious business, and we need to treat it with the honor and the prestige that it had back then. We can't play fast and loose with this word discipleship. We can't play fast and loose with our lives because, because words matter and our lives matter more. And so I ask you, do you remember the feeling of being called? Like transport yourself back to, to that, that pool hall, that, that smoky pool hall where that guy invited you to church. Is that anybody pool hall? No, probably not, right? Or the, the person on the side of the road who just stopped you and, and wanted to have a conversation. Or your best friend who'd been begging you to come to church for years. Do you remember that feeling? Do you remember the energy and the excitement of walking in the room? Do you remember the first time you actually opened the scriptures and it clicked? It was, oh, <laughs> well, this is serious. Oh, my goodness. Does it still feel like that? 
honestly. Do you wake up in the morning and you're like, something could happen today. Yeah. I follow a rabbi yes. and nothing can be the same. Mm -hmm. Is that still the feeling? And if it's, if it's not the feeling, I gotta ask, has the call changed or have you changed? My hunch is that the call is the same. Yeah. The call is the same when you were 15, 25, 35, 45, 55, whatever age you are now, the call didn't change, but, but we do. We get tired. We start getting a little too much dust in our mouths. We're like, I gotta rinse, man. I need a break from all this. Sometimes the rabbi expects maybe a little too much of us. I don't know if I can follow you there. And suddenly it doesn't feel like a privilege anymore, does it? Being a disciple doesn't feel like an honor when the third person this week called you to complain about you. When, you. when you get pulled aside again about that issue that you still haven't been able to repent of, it stops feeling like quite so much of a privilege. But I promise you it is. The call of Jesus has not changed in its importance or its meaning or its urgency because there's no other calling like it. You will not find a single call in all of creation that matches up to the one of Jesus. The first step in the way of Jesus is to radically change your entire existence. <laughs> step one, change everything. You got to understand, Jesus does not ask these guys to get out of the boat. He commands them. He says, follow me. He doesn't say, hey, we do these really cool things on Friday nights. If you want to come check it out and play games, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. We're working on worship. It's getting there. But like, really, it's just about the community. No. I command you, get out of that boat. And they do it. And when we study the Bible with people, we talk about seeking God earnestly or being a disciple. We go, why? Why do you think they would do this? They did it because it was Jesus. Maybe you have like a cooler, more like theological, like context, Bama thing going on. That's awesome. They did it because it was Jesus. Because no one else can call the way that Jesus does. He called them because he is Jesus, and because it was Jesus, they answered. Pure and simple. This is the first step. The first step in the way of Jesus is to radically change your entire existence. Get out of your boat, leave your family behind, change your profession. Where are we sleeping tonight? I don't know. That is the call. And anything less than that is actually not discipleship. Well. The rabbi doesn't say, hey, keep, keep making that money. You smell a little bit like fish. Maybe take a shower. I'll be back in a few weeks. No. Jesus doesn't ask. He commands. And only Jesus can ask you for everything. Yeah. Only Jesus can command this thing. And only Jesus is worth giving everything yeah. for. Yeah. Maybe this is the first time in your life that you feel called by Jesus. Maybe you've circled the, the, the church thing, the religion thing for a long time, and, and it's just starting to strike you at the heart. I want to show you something kind of cool here. In uh, verse, I mean, probably 16, it says, come, follow me. And the Greek word there is akalutheo. Can you say that? Akalutheo. Greek is so easy, guys. Akalutheo, and it means enlist. Mm -hmm. Any vets with us? Were there, day, uh, right, were there days where you're like, I don't really feel like war today? Oh, yes. Ah, hey guys, good luck out there. I'm going to catch up on some reading. Can, are you allowed to do that? Sure, maybe you do feel like that, but there was no like, oh, I think I'm just going to skip this week, if that's cool with you. No, you enlisted. You signed a contract. Maybe you got a little signing bonus too, who knows, right? When you enlisted, you, you signed a contract. I want you to understand if this is the first time that you've been called and if you're weighing this idea of discipleship in your heart and in your mind, just know that, that this is the privilege of like being in the Marines. It's the privilege of being in the, the Navy or the Air Force. What does that add, right? The ad is the few, the proud. Yep. It's a privilege to be called. Mm -hmm. It's an honor. Even in, even in our nation's military, they understand that this is not going to work for everybody. Mm -hmm. Not everyone can do it. Mm -hmm. Everyone's called, but very few <laughs> are able to make it. That's why we celebrate people when they make the decision to become a Christian. You're going to do it seriously? You're going to be a disciple? That's a big deal. Yeah. It's an enlistment. Yeah. And it's an honor. If you've been called, maybe back in that smoky pool hall back in the day, right? I just want you to remember the urgency of your enlistment. There was no sitting on your hands. There was no, ah, I don't know, I'll get back to you guys in a couple of months. No, you've been called by the creator of the universe it's time to go. 
Regardless, if it's your first time or your 50th time feeling called by Jesus, I just hope that you feel honored. That you feel loved and cared for and seen by Jesus. It is an honor to be a disciple. It is a privilege to be a disciple. It's an honor to be called. I want to share a few stories with you about the week. Uh, ways that I saw different students stepping up and answering the call. I would never do this to his face, but Charlie's doing a really good job. I never tell him this. Charlie, Charlie uh, if you don't know this, Charlie actually stepped up this past summer to full time in the ministry. That means he's doing 40 hours a week, which he's like, he's so, I don't even think he can vote yet, right? Like, I don't, I don't know what the story is there. But he wanted to step up, and we were having conversations over the summer, and he was begging me. He's like, what are we going to do on campus? He was getting all, all aggro like he does. Uh, but, but he wanted to answer the call. He said, there's no reason why I shouldn't be helping three, four, five, six guys at a time become Christians. Yeah. Why shouldn't that happen? He says, I have the free time. I want to do it. I want to see people become Christians. He answered the call this week. He was busy, y'all. He's like, I don't know if he has blisters or what, but he was on campus every day ruthlessly sharing his faith with anybody who would get within five feet of him. So proud of Charlie answering the call. I'm proud of one of our sophomores, Sujin. Where's Sujin at? Sujin, her friends call her G-Wagon. Don't ask why. And Sujin, she she survived her freshman year, which is an incredible feat, right? That's big enough, but she came back after this summer, and she was like, "I'm, I'm taking this more seriously. I want to show my friends this incredible thing that I've stumbled upon. Yeah. She took it seriously. And so I kept on meeting people, and they're like, oh, I, I know Sujin. I'm like, hey, how, how'd, you, how'd you get here? Oh, well, Sujin. Sujin was the answer like 50% of the time. Uh, I'm like, what is Sujin up to? But Sujin wanted to answer the call, and she wanted to help her friends this semester. Amen. She answered the call. I'm proud of Autumn making the decision today to become a disciple. Yes, it's awesome. <laughs> These stories should not surprise you. They shouldn't be like, whoa, people want to become Christians? That's crazy. What? No, it's an honor. It's a privilege. Why wouldn't you want to live this life? These stories should not surprise us because it's Jesus calling. Mm -hmm. And because it's Jesus calling, the results are always going to be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Let me show you another scripture. Mark 10, verse 17. Because the call does not always go the way that first time went, unfortunately. But it's important to talk about it. Mark 10, 17. I'm going to pull it up on my Bible, too, because ain't no way I'm reading that font. <laughs> While I'm flipping, craziest thing happened to me. They, uh, they bumped down my prescription. My eyes are getting healthier. How cool is that? I went down a half point in each eye. So, let's keep that trend going. Maybe I'll be shooting lasers out of my eyes by New Year's. In Mark 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Do not give false testimony. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Key part here. Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And then he says the hard part. He loves him, and then he says, one thing you lack. He said, go, sell everything you have, and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, and akalutheo, follow me. Mm. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. You probably know this story. I'm sure you've heard it before. But I love that Jesus decides to call this guy knowing exactly what's in his heart. He sees him. It's the same call, though. I, I appreciate that this young man has the same doubts and excuses and hang-ups that would, that would stop any of us from becoming Christians. Yeah. Yep. I hope you don't look down on this young man. Right. Mm. Stuff he's dealing with, I, I don't know if he's like super overly religious, and that's the problem, or if he's worn out by religion. He's like, I've tried all these rules and regulations. I don't know what's left. I don't know. But regardless, either way, he's avoiding the main thing. And if you don't resonate with any other part of that story, I, I hope you resonate with that part. Yeah, right. Don't we want to avoid the main thing? Yeah. The last thing holding us back, that call. For him, it was the comfort and the security that came from his wealth. Uh-huh. Maybe that's it for you. Maybe you just want money. I get it. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's just fear. 
what if I'm not good enough? What if I can't live up to the call? What's the main thing holding you back? I think it's amazing. It's amazing how many things we throw in the way of our absolute obedience to Jesus. It's incredible. We, we are top-tier excuse makers when we need to be. I would love to be there. I just, oh, man, my, my dog is, is trying to pass his GED. And, got, like, he needs me to make the flashcards. No thumbs. And so, like, you know what I'm saying? It's amazing how many things we throw in the way of our absolute obedience. Maybe it's an obscure theological issue that just needs an answer before you can obey. Once we figure this out as a church, maybe we just pray about it for the next 6 to 12 months, and then I'll start obeying. Maybe it's a past conflict that never actually got resolved. And you love the fact that it hasn't been resolved because it allows you to stay bitter. Great, I have a great excuse to not obey Jesus because of him or her or them or that leader or that person, that guy. Maybe, maybe it's a church culture war that isn't exactly the way you want it to be. You go, I don't really know if this is for me. Our communion cups, it's like a, it's like a Merlot, and I really prefer <laughs> Savion. I, I don't know. Ah. Or something more serious than that. Maybe it's the self-righteousness, the worries of this life. Or maybe it's just apathy. Maybe it's exhaustion, tiredness that threatens to infect our obedience. Regardless of what it was for this guy, Jesus loves him in all of it. Before he calls him, he loves him. Same is true of you. And because Jesus loves this man so much, he doesn't soften the call for him. He doesn't say, hey, listen, I get that you're rich. There's a lot that comes with that. Just come as you are, right? He loves them, but he doesn't cheapen the call. I hope you feel that as well. If you feel like discipleship is hard, good. Yeah. If you wake up and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this today, that's kind of the point. It's a sign of God's love for you that he doesn't cheapen his standards for you. Remember, words matter, right? Words matter, and this is a call to discipleship to following a rabbi to the ends of the earth. And so that frightening step away from your comfort, away from your security blankets, away from all the little rules that you live by, it's baked into the call. Or maybe you hoped that you were special. Maybe when you got baptized, or maybe right now as you're considering baptism, you think, maybe maybe I'm special. Maybe I'm the first disciple in in the history of our faith that Jesus is calling to live the exact same life. Maybe. Maybe Jesus' idea of my new life is just my old life, but I go to more church services. Maybe. I don't know. If somehow that is what Jesus is calling you to, if somehow Jesus is calling you to an exact new life that looks exactly like your old life, Cool, but where's the honor in that? Like, isn't this supposed to be a privilege? Isn't this supposed to be special? Like, I know I was kind of mockingly doing the thing of like, we're disciples, we're special, but we are. Jesus thought so. He thought you were special enough to call. And yet we live our lives as if we're anybody. As if we're everybody. As if discipleship is a convenient box that I can put my life into once a week get my kudos, and go back to whatever. No. No, this is a call from Jesus. This is a call from the Lord of the universe, the creator of everything, who loved you before he called you. Only Jesus can call you to this degree. Only Jesus can ask everything of you. And we can only follow if it's Jesus who calls. Maybe you've tried the Christianity thing before and it didn't stick. I wonder if you were called by Jesus or someone else. Were you called by a girlfriend who just really, really wanted you to try it? Were you called by your mom or your dad who just like wouldn't get off your back? Or were you called by the Lord of the universe? Only Jesus can call us to this degree and we can only follow if it's Jesus who calls. A lot of this, if you're a, a, a reader, you know that a lot of this is coming from a book called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm -hmm. He's a pastor, writer, preacher, martyr, actually, in World War II. He's a German thinker and theologian. And he calls discipleship an an exclusive attachment to his person. Mm. 
an exclusive attachment to Jesus. As in, Jesus put a ring on it. So I don't look anywhere else. And if it's an exclusive attachment, that inevitably means the exclusion of anything that Jesus deems unworthy or unfitting. Jesus will not allow you to get stuck in anything that upends your discipleship. He won't have it. He loves you too much. He thinks too highly of you to let you get caught in some toxic, unhealthy, unfaithful situation. Charlie, next week, he's going to talk about the cost of discipleship and the things that we have to let go of in order to follow Jesus. But, but the challenge for you and for me today is to see this exclusive attachment as an honor. Amen. To see monogamy to Jesus as the greatest privilege that you could possibly be called to. Right. See, when Jesus calls his disciples, he promises a radical departure from the life you know, the rules you live by, and your personal safety net. He promises these things. He promises persecution. He promises transformation, which is not always easy. He promises it all, but he promises so much more. Check out verse 26 in this chapter. This is such good stuff. I love I, This is my favorite part of this, of this whole story. In verse 26, it says the disciples are amazed by this. The disciples were even more amazed. And they said to each other, who then can be saved? If this rich guy can't do it, what hope do we have? Jesus looked at them, and he said, with man, this is impossible. Stop right there for a second. Under your power, you cannot follow Jesus. You're not good enough. The the preacher told me I'm not good enough. Just stick with it. (laughs) With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left everything to follow you. And this guy, Peter, knows because he's the one who got out of the boat. He means it when he says it. In verse 29, I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. I love, I love that Jesus addresses all the anxieties that you would be feeling in this moment. They're so normal. They're so human. I love that Peter says it. Because sometimes Peter's the only one who's willing to say it. But he says it. He says, I've been giving up. I've been sacrificing for years for you. Now what? And Jesus speaks to it. I know that the anxieties that, that accompany this call. What about my family? What about my livelihood? What about my past? What about my habits? What about my addictions? What about me, Jesus? Discipleship doesn't always feel like a privilege. And so for the times that it doesn't feel like a privilege, Jesus just provides three promises in this passage. First one, in verse 27. With man this is impossible, but not with God. With God all things are possible. He promises you and his disciples. He promises his disciples that ordinary men and women can be spiritually empowered by God. That your ordinariness does not disqualify you from the kingdom. Neither do your hang-ups, your fears, your sins, your past, your present. Those things don't disqualify you from being called. Every reason that you're thinking of right now why you could never be a Christian, you really, really should not be sitting in this room, doesn't disqualify you at all. My wife says something sometimes. uh, and I know she got it from somebody. You probably got it from somebody. But it's really good. She says that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He sees you. I know, how great great is Allie? He sees you. He loves you. He he loves you anyways, despite all of everything that he sees. He calls you, and then he turns you into something that you're not. Me? How can I possibly be worthy of that? It's a privilege, guys. It's an honor. That is the first promise. The second promise in verse 30. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters, etc., for me will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Don't let that slip by. Right. In this life, right. your life that you're living right now, that is where the promises begin. He says that full life starts here and now. And yes, 
challenges. Yes, persecutions. Yes, doubts. All of those things are real and they happen. But attached to them are the audacious, gratuitous, scandalous blessings that come with following him. He says all the hard stuff comes, but he promises life to the full here and now. Full means good, bad, and ugly. All the above. See, too many people right now are avoiding the gospel and don't want to come to church with you because the gospel sounds like a really bad layaway plan. It's like, if you just, just sin as little as possible for like 60 years, and then we get hearts. <laughs> Offers on the table, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not particularly good news. Kind of. But it doesn't capture the imagination. And it doesn't mean anything to our friends in the world. But what if you showed them full life right here and now? What if your life was so scandalously blessed that they couldn't help but ask questions? See, as disciples, we have a responsibility to display life to the full. Like, we play games at Devo. We did a roller derby, and somehow we didn't get kicked out of the student union. It was good stuff. But, like, we play games, and we have fun, and we laugh together. Why? Because we live full lives. We're not like a theological seminary institute where we just, like, lock in on Scripture and Greek translations. No, this is life to the full. It's supposed to feel full. We, we, uh, We went and played volleyball on Tuesday and Wednesday night. Life to the full, volleyball. It's got to be in there. But our students started to catch the vision. Because we showed up, and then maybe some friends showed up, and then strangers started hopping in. And Charlie's playing, like, Santana or some weird music. I don't know. He's playing music from, like, the 90s. And the hits of the 80s, 90s, and today. That was Charlie. Uh, he's playing music, and we had popsicles and drinks, and we're, we're meeting people. We're having fun together. It was life to the full. And there was a girl who, who talked to one of us. I can't remember who it was. She said, this is the most community I've ever seen at college. The gospel was preached, but we didn't even have to open our Bibles. And we had friends who saw that, and they were like, well, clearly this is something. And some just wanted free popsicles. It happens. But full life starts now. The last promise from Jesus, also in verse 30, that in the next age, complete life. He says eternal life is what comes next. And in our consciousness, we think of eternal as a measurement of time. That's true. But in the Jewish consciousness, eternal was a measurement of time and quality. The maximum of what life can be, that is what's coming next. And this promise starts to play with the previous promise. It says full life happens in this age, and it points the way to eternal life later. Guys, this is a privilege and a promise. This word discipleship matters because when Jesus calls a man, he calls every single part of him. He doesn't leave anything behind. His first ask in your life is for everything. And because it's Jesus, he follows up that ask with a promise that impossibly outweighs your sacrifices. This is the call of discipleship. And the most scandalous part of it all is that he follows through. He stakes his claim, he makes the offer, and then he actually gives you more. Mm -hmm. Here's the sappy part. Who here likes some sap? (laughs) You maple lovers. The sappy part is that I live a phenomenally blessed life. My life has been an unending streak of green lights. I'm healthy-ish. I mean, you know, but like, (laughs) ride with me. I'm married to, I think, the most incredible woman God's ever made. Personal opinion. If you think something else, you're wrong, but it's fine. I, I have a son who I love, believe it or not, I actually love more than you guys. And he's hugging me today, and he's loving, and he's growing, and God's blessed him as well. I've been a, uh, the truth, though, is I've been a disciple long enough to have lost things. Yeah. Right. Although my life is very good, and I do meaningful work, and I love my life, I've lost relationships. I have lost dreams and hopes. I've lost comforts. And then more, and then more. He calls, and then he calls again. Uh-huh. And he calls again. My favorite artist, Sufjan Stevens, he says he takes... And he takes, and he takes. Sometimes that's what feels the most real to me. But I can track the sacrifices that I've made and the things that have been taken away from me and almost directly correlate them to even greater blessings on the other end. 
vastly superior gifts from Jesus. Allie and Miles, the best friendships that I could ever have or ever will have. Terrific mentoring, meaningful work, and a future. I am phenomenally blessed. And this past week on campus, genuinely, it was one of the most fulfilling weeks that I've had in years. Allie and I did good, meaningful, and difficult work in our previous job. And we're grateful for it. We're grateful that we got to do ministry in the place and in the time that we did, but we came into the PV pretty run down, which you'd never guess because we're such good-looking and, like, (laughs) fun people. These guys struggle never, right? But we're struggling. And we come back this week, and and the the first year on campus was good, and things changed. We saw friends become Christians, but it was hard. And then this week happened, and we caught the vision. We were like, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. People want to become Christians. People want community. People see discipleship as a privilege and a promise. And this is one of those weeks where he gives and he gives and he gives. And so I'm going to celebrate it. I hope you do as well. I want to keep answering the call of Jesus. I want to keep finding out how much more he has in store for me. And if you want to find out too, I just want you to consider three things. Three things that you can do this week to begin to answer the call of Jesus. The first is just to listen. We live in a noisy world. Too many distractions. Half of y'all are checking your fantasy teams right now. I get it. It happens. But what would it look like this week to turn down the noise, to put the phone in a different room, because you're not that important, and to just listen for five minutes each day this week? To start that time and say, God, what would you call me to do? And then you just listen for five minutes. Maybe you take some notes. See what God puts on your heart. And then compare that, of course, to scripture and, and share that with people that you trust. But what would it look like to just listen for five minutes this week? Yeah. Second thing is just to consider the call. Take this seriously. You are being called right now. This moment. This is a special moment in your life. You're being called by Jesus. Please consider it. Please take it seriously. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you're a newbie at this and you haven't studied the Bible, please study the scriptures as if your life hung in the balance. I beg you to see if Jesus means what he says. If you have studied the Bible, if you have made the pledge of discipleship in your life, I want to encourage you to study the scriptures as if your life hung in the balance. I thought about this this week because, I mean, meeting these young guns, I remember being young young at one point. (laughs) (laughs) I thought, how would I study the Bible with me if I met me? Would I even want to, honestly? If you saw you at work or on the street or in the grocery store or whatever, how would you study the Bible with you right now in the way that you live, in the way that you do things? The easiest way to figure out what you need to grow in is just to get input from somebody else. To go to you know, a friend, a trusted confidant, and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, is my discipleship worthy of imitating? <laughs> Do you want to follow me the way I follow Christ? Uh, some, in some ways, maybe. Trust me, you'll have a lot to consider if you ask that question. The last thing here, just answer the call. When Jesus calls, he is not asking. He is commanding, and only he can do it. Jesus is commanding something of you this morning. He wants you to change. He wants you to become something that you're not. And only Jesus can command it. What is it for you? Does he call you to leap out of the boat in some special or unique way that you've never dared to before? Well, whatever it is, he promises you something so much more than what you have. He promises nothing less than full life now and to come. Who else could make that offer? Who else could command you to do so? So answer and see if he gives you anything less than everything. Guys, discipleship is a privilege and it comes with a promise. It's deeply sacred and it's available to every single one of us. Bonhoeffer calls it an exclusive attachment to his person. Mm -hmm. Only Jesus calls because only Jesus can call us Mm -hmm. in this way. It is death to yourself and it is life to the full. So let us be a family of obedient followers. Let us be a family of true disciples who make that word count, who embody the privilege and the promise of that name as we answer his unique and beautiful call. God bless.